Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this multi-part video series, we will continue our review of oral health topics for USMLE Step 1. In this presentation, we'll begin focusing on the common oral lesions you will need to be familiar with. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. As you recall, in our first video, we covered the relevant anatomy of the oral cavity. In this recording, we will resume our discussion focusing on the key oral lesions with which you should be familiar. So here are the lesions we'll be discussing in this section. The list is lengthy, but with some prompting you will discover that the oral health topics for USMLE Step 1 are straightforward with recognizable features. And just an FYI, at the conclusion of Section 2, there will be a few questions to assess your basic understanding of these topics. So with that background, let's get started. As you can see, oral lesions can be broken into manageable categories based on the cause of the lesion. We'll launch into this discussion with a focus on viral lesions. Ulcerative lesions in the mouth can occur as a result of viral infections, but not all ulcerative lesions are viral and they each have unique features. In this section, we are going to touch on the high yield viral infections that can cause lesions in the oral cavity. During this presentation, I'll highlight the distinguishing traits and key clinical manifestations. The five viruses we'll be focusing on include measles, herpes simplex, Coxsackie, EBV, and adenovirus. So let's start with measles, also known as rubeola. This is a paramyxovirus, which presents with a hallmark lesion in the mouth called coplic spots. Coplic spots are commonly described as bright red spots with a blue-white center on the buccal mucosa. The classic presentation includes a child with a history of fever, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis, which of course are nonspecific symptoms. But this is followed by the appearance of coplic spots in the oral mucosa, followed by the development of a descending body rash. So small, irregular red spots on the buccal mucosa with a blue-white center appearing just before a descending body rash equals measles. This presentation will be the defining characteristic, but what if the oral lesion is more vesicular than a coplic spot? Vesicular lesions are indicative of herpes virus, and although herpes will eventually ulcerate, the initial presentation is more of a vesicle. This is a key feature in distinguishing from apis ulcers, which are discussed in later sections. Herpes labialis, also known as a cold sore, is located on the lip and is a common manifestation, but herpes lesions can also occur on oral mucosa. On the lip, a herpes lesion will often crust over after the vesicles rupture. Gingivostomatitis can occur as a manifestation of HSV-1 in children. This presents as a vesicular ulcer anywhere in the oral cavity from the tongue to the pharynx and is often associated with cervical lymphadenopathy. For HSV, a key derivative will be the pathology description of the zinc prep. You should be familiar with the description of the multinucleate giant cell. To review, this prep is done by swabbing material from the base of the vesicle onto a slide and staining it with right stain. A positive smear demonstrates the characteristic multinucleated giant cell. Be aware that these may also be seen in HSV2 and VZV, varicella zoster virus. Active HSV infections can be treated with acyclovir or valacyclovir. Both of these agents are activated by viral thymidine kinase, which phosphorylates the guanosine analog and is then incorporated into viral DNA during replication. In doing so, it subsequently ceases viral replication by chain termination. These medications are only efficacious for an active infection and have no effect on latent HSV. Because the activation of both acyclovir and valacyclovir is dependent on viral thymidine kinase, they have no effect on uninfected cells and therefore they have few adverse effects. Moving on, if a patient presents with ulcers in and around the mouth along with oval-shaped vesicles on the palms of hands and soles of feet, think Coxsackie virus, a picornavirus. Coxsackie, also known as hand, foot, and mouth disease, is more common in children. It will often present with fever in addition to oral ulcerations and the classic hand and foot rash. This characteristic presentation makes for a fairly straightforward diagnosis. But, what if the lesion is described as a white plaque that cannot be scraped off? Well, now we're talking about oral hairy leukoplakia. Oral hairy leukoplakia is described as a white plaque on the lateral tongue which cannot be scraped off. It may be caused by Epstein-Barr virus, which belongs to the herpes family of viruses. EBV is a herpes virus, HHV4. Oral hairy leukoplakia is also associated with individuals who are HIV positive or immunosuppressed. EBV is best known for causing mononucleosis, the kissing disease, which presents with fever, pharyngitis, 
hepatosplenomegaly, and posterior cervical lymphadenopathy. It is often seen in college-aged patients. EBV mononucleosis can be diagnosed with a positive monospot test, which is also referred to as a heterophile test, characterized by agglutination of sheep red blood cells. You should be familiar with other complications of EBV infection related to our discussion of oral pathology, including both nasopharyngeal carcinoma and lymphoma. Endemic, or the African form of Burkitt's lymphoma, you will recall, presents with a rapidly enlarging jaw mass. 100% of these patients have had EBV exposure. Let's move on to adenovirus. The most common virus causing the most common form of pharyngitis, that being viral pharyngitis. In these vignettes, a patient will be described with an erythematous appearing pharynx devoid of any exudates, ulcers, and vesicles. Pretty bland stuff. You'll know it's a viral pharyngitis based on the lack of other findings and complications. Buzzwords are febrile pharyngitis in patients under 3 years old, as this is the most common population affected with adenovirus pharyngitis. But viruses aren't the only pathogens that can cause pharyngitis. Before proceeding, let's summarize what we've covered so far. So these are the five important viral infections to be familiar with in oral health. Each has a distinctive pattern with distinguishing features and predictable step one derivatives. So let's move on to bacterial causes of oral lesions and specifically bacterial causes of pharyngitis. This will not be an exhaustive review, but we will touch base on the two main bacterial causes of pharyngitis, Streptococcus pyogenes, also known as group A strep, and Cornobacterium diphtheriae. As you know, Streptococcus pyogenes is classified as a gram-positive coccus growing in chains. The operative phrase here is pyogenes, as in pyogenic, so group A pharyngitis will be described with the white exudate on the tonsils and pharynx. Other symptoms will include fever plus anterior cervical adenopathy in contrast to the posterior cervical adenopathy seen in EBV. Untreated group A strep pharyngitis may be complicated by rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis, both of which are major step one subjects. Detailed review of these topics are available in other 12-day presentations. In addition to pharyngitis, strep pyogenes can also cause impetigo, which may result in perioral lesions. These will be easy to identify given their classic description of honey-crested lesions. And just as a reminder, streptococcal skin infections may result in post-strep glomerulonephritis, but does not cause acute rheumatic fever. Only pharyngeal infection is associated with the rheumatic fever complication. Let's move on to another important board favor, Cornobacterium diphtheriae. C. diphtheriae is a gram-positive rod that produces a toxin that is responsible for the majority of the clinical manifestations. The key derivative for diphtheria is its exotoxin. It's an AB toxin that inhibits protein synthesis via ADP ribosylation of elongation factor 2. The net result is cell necrosis, manifested in the pharynx by the characteristic gray pseudomembrane. Recall, this is a vaccine-preventable disease which becomes a target for test derivatives. The diphtheria vaccine, available as TD or Tdap, is the prototypic conjugated vaccine on step 1, with the buzz phrase being conjugated. Conjugated vaccines are a board's favorite, emphasizing the role of T helper cells in stimulating both the production of plasma cells as well as memory B cells. The goal of a conjugated vaccine is to elicit a stronger and more durable immune response than the individual components in the vaccine are able to on their own. With that background, you're able to predict the key demographic for diphtheria questions, which is unvaccinated children. More often than not, this unvaccinated child would be described as coming from a developing country or from parents who are morally opposed to vaccinations. In terms of classic findings, pharyngitis caused by diphtheria will be characterized by grayish pseudomembranes that can result in airway obstruction. They may also have severe lymphadenopathy, euphemistically described by a bull neck appearance. When you hear pharyngitis with a description of gray-white pseudomembranes, think diphtheria. Be prepared to identify the pathologic description of a pseudomembrane, including a raised grayish-white membrane composed of neutrophils, dead or sloughed epithelial cells, and inflammatory, fibrin-containing debris. The pseudomembrane may be described as bleeding when scraped. So these are the two important bacterial infections to be familiar with in oral health. Each has a distinctive pattern with distinguishing features and step one derivatives. So let's take a quick break. When we resume, 
We'll pick up our discussion with a review of the fungal infections presenting in the oral cavity. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.